Hello and welcome to Fireside Fairy Tales. If you've never been here before, my name is Rory and you're watching Varietal Literature's YouTube page. Varietal Literature is a group of writers from Vancouver who enjoy narrative. Uh, we do three things on this channel. Tuesday nights, though, tonight, we do fold folk tales and fairy tale readings. And we have, honestly, a great one tonight. Now, I realize in the world of the internet where things fly by at a million miles an hour. It is hard for me to make the case that it is worth it to sit here and listen to a tale for an hour. Um, <clears throat> and normally I don't bother to make that case because you show up or you don't, right? Uh, but this story is a classic kind of pre-Christian Celtic tale um, that is has highs and lows. It's not just weird. It is a genuinely interesting wild kind of tragic beautiful romantic tale called the story of deirdre <clears throat> and uh i really can't wait to tell it to you tonight but i should say that the channel also on wednesday nights starting tomorrow we're starting a new season uh, uh do a book club it's an online book club you read uh in this case part one of a book called junie by shaleen knight and uh we meet together and we uh, myself and Avalon Bourne with the live chat, which you can join in, will talk to us about what you thought of that part of the book. And that's about it. It's it's like enjoying books together, but on a global scale with a stream. It's all Vancouver authors. Uh, it's all kind of up and coming stuff that you probably wouldn't have heard of. And then on uh, Thursday nights, we do sort of write along streams where I write stuff and chat contributes and we try to make something together. <clears throat> um... With that said, I also wanted to mention that I wrote two stories this week. They're both postcard stories, before I get like a round of applause here. But they're both available on the Varietal Literature YouTube page. One of them, the most recent one, Follow the River Home, is down in the comment, uh, in the description of this uh, video. You can click on it and read it. It takes less than five minutes to read. It's a very short story. That's the point of postcard stories. With that said, the description below, if you are not watching this live, will also have timestamps uh which allows you to skip over stuff uh <clears throat> and only go to the parts that you care about so if you just want to jump ahead to the beginning of the story of Deidre, go down there and click that it'll get you right there it's the only thing we're doing tonight because it is a longer story uh, <clears throat> yeah yeah that's that's uh, a, a lot of news but it's been a busy week for me and i don't know about you guys you let me know in the chat how busy it's been for you what's this chat on this side um, <laughs> it doesn't help that I'm mirrored and I cannot see it as a YouTube page. Uh, but if you are in the live chat, uh, you can join in and, and add comments about the story as I read it. I don't really respond to them during the reading, but at the end we can discuss it a bit if you really want. Um, I usually say a few things at the end. But never at the beginning because it gives stuff away. Which means that it is time for me to lower the sound of the fireplace. Because, as you know, we have lately been working with stories that have sound effects. <clears throat> um, I'm even going to lower the music just a touch. And we'll start the rain 
actually, let, let me introduce the story. This is called The Story of Deidre from the book Celtic Fairy Tales. It is a traditional tale, this one being focused in Ireland. And let me know if the audio is getting muddy and I can lower some stuff. There was a man in Ireland once who was called Malcolm Harper. The man was a right good man and he had a goodly share of this world's goods. He had a wife but no family. What did Malcolm hear but that a soothsayer had come home to the place? And as the man was a right good man, he wished that the soothsayer might come near them. Whether it was that he was invited or that he came of himself, the soothsayer came to the house of Malcolm. Are you doing any soothsaying? says Malcolm. Yes, I am doing a little. Are you in need of soothsaying? Well, I do not mind taking soothsaying from you. If you had soothsaying for me, and you would be willing to do it, well, I do soothsaying for you. What kind of soothsaying do you want? Well, the soothsaying I wanted was that you would tell me my lot, or what will happen to me, and if you can give me knowledge of it. Well, hmm, I am going out, and when I return, I will tell you. And so the soothsayer went forth out of the house, and he was not long outside when he returned. Well, said the soothsayer, I saw in my second sight that it is on account of your daughter of yours that the greatest amount of blood shall be shed that has ever been shed in Erin since time and race began. And the three most famous heroes that ever were found will lose their heads on her account. After a time, a daughter was born to Malcolm. He did not allow a living being to come to his house, only himself and the nurse. He asked this woman, <clears throat> Will you yourself keep up the child to keep her in hiding? Far away, where I will not see a sight of her, nor ear hear a word of her. The woman said she would, so Malcolm got three men, and he took them away to a large mountain, distant and far from reach. Without the knowledge or notice of anyone, he caused there a hillock round and green to be dug out of the middle, and the hole thus made to be covered carefully over so that a little company could dwell there together. This was done. In other words, they made a little hobbit hole, which is delightful. <clears throat> the woman said she would. So, oh, sorry. Deidre and her foster mother dwelt in the Bothy mid the hills without the knowledge or the suspicion of any living person about them and without anything occurring until Deidre was 16 years of age. Deidre grew like the white sapling, straight and trim and as the rash on the moss. She was the creature of fairest form, of loveliest aspect, and of gentlest nature that existed between earth and heaven in all Ireland. Whatever color of hue she had before her, there was nobody that looked into her face, but she would blush fiery red over it. The woman that had charge of her gave Deirdre every information and skill of which she herself had knowledge and skill. There was not a blade of grass growing from root, nor a bird singing in the wood, nor a star shining from heaven, but Deidre had a name for it. But one thing she did not wish her to have either part or parley with any single living man of the rest of the world but on a gloomy winter night, 
with black scowling clouds a hunter of game was wearily traveling the hills and what happened but that he missed the trail of the hunt and lost his course and companion a drowsiness came upon the man as he warily wandered over the hills and he lay down by the side of a beautiful green knoll on which Deirdre lived and he slept the man was faint from hunger and wandering and benumbed with cold and a deep sleep fell upon him and when he lay down beside the green hill where Deidre was, a troubled dream came to the man, and he thought that he enjoyed the warmth of a fairy brook. But the fairies in being inside playing music. The hunter shouted out in his dream, if there was anyone in the brook, to let him in for the Holy One's sake. Deidre here heard the voice and said to her foster mother, Oh, foster mother! What cry is that? It is nothing at all, Deirdre. Merely the birds of the air astray and seeking each other. But let them go past to the bosky glade. There is no shelter or house for them here. Oh, foster mother, the birds ask to get inside for the sake of the god of the elements. And you yourself tell me that anything that is asked in his name we ought to do. If you will not allow the bird that is being benumbed with cold and done to death with hunger to be let in, I do not think much of your language or your faith. But since I give credence to your language and to your faith, which you taught me, I will let myself, I will myself let the bird in. And Deidre arose. <clears throat> and drew the bolt from the leaf of the door and she led in the hunter and placed a seat in the place for sitting a food in the place for eating and drink in the place for drinking for the man who came into the house <clears throat> oh for this life and ramen your man you man that came in keep restraint on your tongue said the old woman it's not a great thing for you to keep your mouth shut and your tongue quiet when you get a home and shelter of a hearth on a gloomy winter's night. <clears throat> well, said the hunter, I may do that. Keep my mouth shut and my tongue quiet since I came to the house and received hospitality from you. But by the hand of thy father and grandfather, and by your own two hands, if some other of the people of the world saw this beautitious creature you have here hid away, they would not long leave her with you, I swear. What men are these you refer to? Oh. <laughs> what men are these that you refer to? said Deirdre. Well, I'll tell you, young woman, said the hunter. <clears throat> they are Nisha, son of Ishna. And Alan and Arden and his two brothers. What like are these men when seen, if we were to see them? said Deidre. Why the aspect and form of the men when seen are these, said the hunter. They have the color of the raven on their hair, their skin like swan on the wave and whiteness, and their cheeks has the blood of a brindled red calf, and their spear speed and their leap are those of the salmon of the torrent and the deer of the gray mountainside. And Nisha is heads and shoulders above the rest of the people of Aaron. However they are, said the nurse, <coughs> be you off from here and take another road. And king of light and sun, in good sooth and certainty, little are my thanks for yourself or for her that let you in. Well, the hunter went away and went straight to the palace of the king of Conacher. He sent word in to the king that he wished to speak to him, if he pleased. The king answered the message and came out to speak to the man. <clears throat> 
What is the reason of your journey? said the king to the hunter. I have only to tell you, king, said the hunter, that I saw the fairest creature that ever was born in Erin, and I came to tell you of it. Who is this beauty, and where is she to be seen? When she was not seen before, tell you saw her, if you did see her. Well, I did see her, said the hunter, but if I did, no man else can see her unless he gets directions from me as to where she is dwelling. Yeah, I know, the, the guy just basically immediately breaks his promise. And, by the way, nothing really comes of that. <clears throat> and you will direct me to where she dwells. And the reward of your directing me will be as good as the reward of your message, said the king. Well, I will direct you, king, although it is likely that this will not be what they want, said the hunter. Conacher, king of Ulster, sent for his nearest kinsmen, and he told them of his intent. Though early rose the song of the birds mid the rocky caves, and the music of the birds in the grove, earlier than that did Conacher, king of Ulster, arise with his little troop of dear friends. In the delightful twilight of the fresh and gentle May, the dew was heavy on each bush and flower and stem, as they went on to bring Deidre forth from the green knoll where he stayed. Many a youth was there who had a lithe leaping and lissom step when they started whose step was faint, failing and faltering when they reached the bothy on account of the length of the way and roughness of the road. Yonder now, down in the bottom of the glen, is the bothy where the woman dwells. But I will not go nearer than this to the old woman, said the hunter. Conacher, with his band of kinsfolk, went down to the green knoll where Deirdre dwelt. And he knocked at the door of the bothy. The nurse replied, <coughs> No less than a king's command and a king's army could put me out of my bothy tonight. And I should be obliged to you were you to tell who it is that wants me to open my bothy door. <clears throat> it is I, Conacher, King of Ulster. Well, when the poor woman heard who was at the door, she rose with haste and let in the king and all that could get in of his retinue. When the king saw the woman that was before him, that he had been in quest of, he thought he never saw in the course of the day, nor in the dream of the night, a creature so fair as Deirdre. And he gave his full heart's weight of love to her. Deirdre was raised on the topmost of the hero's shoulders, and she and her foster mother were brought to the court of King Conacher of Ulster. With the love that Conacher had for her, he wanted to marry Deirdre right off there and then. Will she nil? She marry him. But she said to him, I would be obliged to you if you will give me the respite of a year and a day. He said, I will grant you that, hard though it is, if you will give me your unfailing promise that you will marry me at the year's end. So she gave the promise. Conacher got for her a woman teacher and a merry, modest maiden's fair that would lie down and rise with her, that would play and speak with her. Deirdre was clever in maidenly duties and wifely understanding. <laughs> Love that term. And Conacher thought he never saw with bodily eye a creature that pleased him more. Deirdre and her woman companions were one day out on the hillock behind the house. <clears throat> Enjoying the scene and drinking in the sun's heat. What did they see coming but three men a-journeying? 
Deirdre was looking at the men that were coming and wondering at them. When the men neared them, Deirdre remembered the language of the huntsmen. And she said to herself that these were the three sons of Ishna, and that this was Nisha. <clears throat> he having what was Conacher. He having what was above the bend of the two shoulders, above the men of Aaron all. The three brothers went past without taking any notice of them, without even glancing at the young girls on the hillock. What happened but that love for Nisha struck the heart of Deirdre, so that she could not fo but follow after him. She girded up her raiment and went after the men that went past the base of the knoll, leaving her woman attendants there. Alan and Arden had heard of the woman that Conacher, king of Ulster, had with him, and they thought that if Nisha, their brother, saw her, he would have her himself. And more especially as she was not married to the king, they perceived the woman coming and called on one another to hasten their step as they had a long distance to travel, and the dusk of night was coming. They did so, and she cried, Nisha, son of Vishnu, will ye leave me? What piercing shill cry is that? The most melodious my ear I've heard, and the shrillest that ever struck my heart of all the cries I ever heard. It is anything else but the wail of the wave swans of Conacher, said his brothers. No! Yonder is a woman's cry of distress, said Nisha, and he swore he would not go farther until he saw from whom the cry came, and Nisha turned back. Nisha and Deirdre met. Deirdre kissed Nisha three times and gave a kiss each to his brothers. With the confusion that she was in, Deirdre went into a crimson blaze of fire. Her color came and went as rapidly as the movement of the aspen by the stream side. Nisha thought ne he never saw a fairer creature, and Nisha gave Deirdre the love that he never gave to thing, to vision, or to creature, but to herself. Then Nisha placed Deirdre on the topmost height of his shoulder and told his brothers to keep up their pace, and they kept up their pace. Nisha thought <clears throat> it would not be well for him to remain in Aaron on account of the way in which Conacher, king of Ulster, his uncle's son, had gone against him because of the woman, though he had not married her. And he turned back to Elba, that is, Scotland. He reached the side of the Loch Ness and made his habitation there. He could kill the salmon of the torrent from his own door and the deer from the grey gorge out of his window. Nisha and Deirdre and Alan and Arden dwelt in a tower and they were happy so long a time as they were there. By this time the end of the period came at which Deirdre had to marry Conacher, king of Ulster. Conacher made up his mind to take Deirdre away by the sword, whether she was married to Nisha or not. So he prepared a great and gleeful face feast. I'm sorry. He sent word far and wide through Aaron all to his kinspeople to come to the feast. Conacher thought to himself that Nisha would not come though he should bid him, and the scheme that arose in his mind was to send his father's brother. And I will swear I spent a good 20 minutes listening to a pronunciation of this next word. Could not get it, so I'm just going to call it macro. Closest I could get is but Macro, his brother, his father's brother, his uncle, and to send him on an embassy to Nisha. He did so, and Conacher said to Macro, <clears throat> Tell Nisha, son of Ishna, 
that I am setting forth a great and gleeful feast to my friends and king's people throughout the wide extent of air and all, and that I shall not have rest by day nor sleep by night if he and Alan and Arden be not partakers of the feast. Macro and his three sons went on their journey and reached the tower where Nisha was dwelling by the side of Loch Edif. If the sons of Ishna gave a cordial, kindly welcome to Macro and his three sons and asked of him the news of Aaron. The best news I have for you, said the hardy hero, is that Conacar, king of Ulster, is setting forth a great, sumptuous feast to his friends and kinspeople through the wide extent of Ur and Ull, and he has vowed by the earth beneath him, by the high heaven above him, and by the sun that wends to the west, that he will have no rest by day nor sleep by night if the sons of Eshna, the sons of his own father's brother, will not come back to the land of their home and the soil of their nativity, and to the feast likewise. And he has sent us on embassy to invite you. We will go with you, said Nisha. Pardon me, I need some water there. We will, said his brothers. But Deirdre did not wish to go with Macro. <clears throat> she tried every prayer to turn Nisha from going with him, and she said, I saw a vision, Nisha. How and, and do you interpret it to me, said Deirdre, and then she sang. <laughs> o Nisha, son of Vishna, hear what was shown in a dream to me. There came three white doves out of the south, flying over the sea. And drops of honey were in their mouth from the hive of the honeybee. O Nisha, son of Vishna, hear what was shown in a dream to me. I saw three grey hawks out of the south come flying over the sea, and the red, red drops they bear in their mouth, they were dearer than life to me. Well, said Nisha, it is not but fear of a woman's heart, and a dream of the night, Deirdre. The day that Conacher sent the invitation to his feast, <clears throat> the day that Conacher sent the invitation to his feast will be unlucky for us if we don't go, O oh Deirdre. You will go there, said Macro. And if Conacher show kindness to you, show you kindness to him. And if he will display wrath towards you, display your wrath towards him, and I and my three sons will be with you. We will, said Daring Drop. We will, said Hardy Holly. And we will, said Fialan the Fair. I have three sons, and they are three heroes and in any harm or danger that may befall you they will be with you and i myself will be along with them and macro gave his vow and his word in presence of his arms that in any danger that came the way to the sons of ishna he and his three sons would not leave head on live body in erin despite sword or helmet spear or shield blade or mail be they ever so good Deirdre was unwilling to leave Alba, and she went with Nisha, but she went with Nisha. Deirdre wept tears in showers, and she sang, Dear is the land, the land over there. Elba is full of woods and lakes. Bitter to my heart is leaving thee, but I go away with Nisha. Macro didn't stop till he got to the, the sons of Ishna, away with him, despite the suspicion of Deirdre. The coracle was put to sea, the sail was hoisted to it, and the second morrow they arrived on the white shores of Erin. And as soon as the sons of Ishna landed in Erin, Macro sent word to Conacher, king of Ulster, that the men whom he wanted were come, and let him now show kindness to them. Well, 
said Conacher. I did not expect that the sons of Ishna would come, though I send for them. And I am not quite ready to receive them, but there is a house down yonder where I keep strangers and let them go down to it today, and my house will be ready for them tomorrow. But he was up in the palace, felt, but he that was up in the palace felt it long that he was not getting word as to how matters were going on for those down in the house of the strangers. Go on, Gerubin Grednach. Son of Lachlan's king, go you down and bring me information as to whether her former hue and complexion are on Deirdre. <coughs> <coughs> if they be, I will take her out with the edge of blade and point of sword. And if not, let Nisha, son of Ishna, have her for himself, said Conakar. Gelbin, the cheering and charming son of Lachlan's king, went down to the place of the strangers where the sons of Ishna Deirdre were staying. He looked in through the bicker hole on the door leaf. Now she sat, that he gazed upon. Sorry. Now she that he gazed upon used to go into a crimson blaze of blushes when anyone looked at her. Nisha looked at Deirdre and knew that someone was looking at her from the back of the door leaf because she was blushing. He seized one of the dice on the table before him and fired it through the bicker hole, knocking the eye out of Gelbin Grednach and ch the cheerful and charming right through the back of his head. Gelbin returned back to the palace of King Conacher. You were cheerful and charming going away, but you are cheerless, charmless returning. What has happened to you, Galban? But have you seen her and our Deirdre's hues and complexion as before, said Conacher. Well, I have seen our Deirdre, and I saw her also truly, and while I was looking at her through the bicker hole on the door, Nisha, son of Ishna, knocked out my eye with one of the dice in his hand. But of truth and verity, although he put out even my eye, it were my desire still to remain looking at her with the other eye, were it not for the hurry you told me to be in, said Galbin. That is true, said Conacher. Let three hundred brave heroes go down to the abode of the strangers and let them bring hither to me, Deirdre, and kill the rest. Conacher ordered 300 active heroes to go down to the abode of the strangers and to take Deirdre up with them and kill the rest. Pursuit is coming, said Deirdre. Yes, but I will myself go out and stop the pursuit, said Nisha. It is not you, but we that will go, said Daring Drop and Hardy Holly and Fialin the Fair. It is to us that our father entrusted your defense from harm and danger when he himself left for home. And the gallant youths, full noble, full manly, full handsome, with beautitious brown locks, went forth girt with battle arms, fit for fierce fight, and clothed with combat dress for fierce contest Bit, which was burnished, bright, brilliant, bladed, blazing, on which were many pictures of beasts and birds and creeping things, lion and lithe-limbed tigers, brown eagle and harrying hawk with an adder fierce. And to the young heroes laid low three-thirds of the company. Well... Conacher came out in haste and cried with wrath, Who is here on the floor of fight slaughtering my men? We, the three sons of Macro. Well, said the king, I will give you a free bridge to your grandfather, a free bridge to your father, a free bridge each to you three brothers if you come over to my side tonight. 
Well, Conacher, we will not accept that offer from you nor thank you for it. Greater by far do we prefer to go home to our father and tell the deeds of our heroism we have done than accept anything on these terms from you. Nisha, son of Ishna, and Alan, and Arin are as nearly related to yourself as they are to us. And though you are so keen to shed their blood, and you would shed our blood as also, Conacher. And the noble, manly, handsome youths with beautitious brown locks returned inside. We are now, said they, going home to tell our father that you are now safe from the hands of the king. And the youths, all fresh and tall and lithe and beautiful, went home to their father to tell that the sons of Ishna were safe. This happened at the parting of the day and night in the morning twilight time, and Nisha said they must go away, leave that house, and return to Alba. Nisha, Deirdre, Alan, and Arden started to return to Alba. Word came to the king <clears throat> that the company he was in pursuit of were gone. The king then sent for Duanan, Gacha Druid, the best magician he ever had, and he spoke to him as follows Much wealth I have expended on you, Duanan, Gacha Druid. Give schooling and learning and magic mystery to you. If these people get away from me today without care, without consideration or regard for me, without chance of overtaking them, and without power to stop them. Well, I will stop them, said the magician, and tell the company you send in pursuit return. And the magician placed a wood before them through which no man could go. But the sons of Ishna. <coughs> marched through the wood without halt or hesitation. And Deirdre hold on to Nisha's hand. What is the good of all that? That will not do yet, <clears throat> said Conacher. They were off without bending of their feet or stopping of their step without heed or respect. And I am without power to keep up to them or to opportunity to turn them back this night. I will try another plan on them, said the druid. And he placed before them a green, <clears throat> uh, before them a gray sea instead of a green plain. The three heroes stripped and tied their clothes behind their head, and Nisha placed Deirdre on top of his shoulder. They stretched their sides to the stream, and sea and land they were the same. The rough grey oceans was the same as metal land, green and plain. Though that be good, O Duanan, it will not make the heroes return, said Conacher. They are gone without regard for me, and without honor to me, and without power on my part to pursue them, or to force them to return this night. We shall try another method on them. Since yon one did not stop them, said the druid. And the druid froze the Grey Ridge Sea into hard, rocky <coughs> knobs. The sharpness of the sword being on the one edge and the poison power of adders on the other. Then Arden cried that he was getting tired and nearly giving over. Come here, Arden, sit on my shoulder, said Nisha. Arden came and sat on Nisha's shoulder. Arden was long in this posture when he died. But though he was dead, Nisha would not let him go. Alan then cried out that he was getting fate and nigh well giving up. When Nisha heard his prayer, he gave forth the piercing sigh of death and asked Alan to lay hold of him and he would bring him to land. Alan was not long when the weakness of death came on him and his hold failed. 
Nisha looked around, and when he saw his two beloved brothers dead, he cared not whether he lived or died, and he gave forth the bitter sigh of death, and his heart burst. They are gone. Said Duanin, Gacha Druid, to the king. I have done what you desired me. The sons of Ishna are dead, and they will trouble you no more. You have your wife hale and whole to yourself. Blessings for that upon you, and may the good results accrue to me, Duanin. I count it no loss what I spent in the schooling and teaching of you. Now dry up the flood and let me see if I can behold Deirdre, said Conacher. And Duanan dried up the flood from the plain and the three sons of Ishna were lying together, dead, without breath of life, side by side on the green meadow plain. And Deirdre was bending over, showering down her tears. Then Deirdre said this lament. Fair one, loved one, the flower of beauty, beloved upright and strong, beloved noble and modest warrior, fair one, blue-eyed, beloved of thy wife, lovely to me at the trysting place came thy clear voice through the woods of Ireland. I cannot eat or smile henceforth, break not today my heart, soon I shall lie within my grave. Strong are the waves of sorrow, but stronger is sorrow's self, Conacher. The people then gathered round the hero's bodies and asked Conacher what was to be done with the bodies. The order that he gave was that they should dig a pit and put three brothers in it side by side. Deirdre kept sitting on the brink of the grave, constantly asking the grave diggers to dig the pit wide and free. And when the bodies of the brothers were put in the grave, Deirdre said, Come over hither, Nisha, my love. Let Arden close to Alan lie. If the dead had any sense to feel, ye would have made a place for Deirdre. The men did as she told them. She jumped into the grave and lay down by Nisha. She was dead by his side. The king ordered the body to be raised from out of the grave and to be buried on the other side of the lock. It was done as the king bade and the pit closed and thereupon a fir shoot grew out of the grave of Deirdre and a fir shoot from the grave of Nisha and the two shoots united in a knot above the lock. And the king ordered the shoots to be cut down And this was done twice, until at the third time the wife whom the king had married caused him to stop this work of evil and his vengeance on the remains of the dead. And that is the story of Deirdre. See, Gs has written a few things. Gs says, "Holy one, would that be in a? Well, who would that be in a pre-Christian story? Um, given that they never name it, I'm kind of guessing that the interpretation here is sort of leaving it vague. But she says later, uh, the god of the elements. Uh, so I imagine it's it's uh, a pagan pre-Christian god. There's a a few that it could be. This is Celtic." Um, there are a few therein, um, of people, peoples and, and mythical types that may be being referenced here. <clears throat> There's one I cannot think of the name of. I think it starts with a V. Um, Gia says, right through the back of his, his head, good shot. Yeah, and then he was kind of joyless. I like how the king noticed his lack of charm before he noticed that there was a literal hole through his head and no eye. 
JS says, this is tragic. Indeed. Yeah, it's a tragedy. Yeah, the thing is, is, I can't open by saying it's tragedy or people are going to know what's coming, right? And uh, the, the story does a really solid job. Um, I'm surprised at how, like, modern it is in this sense because it opens with this uh, soothsayer's statement that kind of doesn't really happen. Like, it kind of happens and it kind of doesn't. But in it is this specific clause that three heroes she will cause to be beheaded. And so the story keeps introducing groups of three men. And it's it, it's a great way to like be like, as a reader, you're like, is that the three men? Is this it? The ones who dig the hole? Is that the three men? Is it Nisha and his brothers? Is it, you know, uh, what's his name? Za, three sons? It seems like it's going to be his three sons at that point. And then they, the slaughter, the blood, the 300 that die at the hands of those brothers. Um, it never really comes to turn. <clears throat> However, I, I do have an interpretation. Now, I don't know if the, the story is that clever about this, but I'm going to go back for a minute. Uh, see if I can find it again where his uncle is talk makes his plea. I think this is it. Macro gave his vow and his word in presence of his arms that in any harm or danger that came the way of the sons of Ishna, he and his three sons would not leave head on live body in Eren, despite sword or helmet, spear or shield, blade or mail, be they ever so good. And the, the thing that I wonder is um, that vow doesn't seem to preclude his sons. So I wonder if they went back, if the implication is they went back to tell of their deeds and because of the words of his bond, he beheads his three sons. And it's just the story doesn't tell you. Um, but uh, <clears throat> that was just the thought I had. I, I'm not sure. Anyways. What more do you want from a folk tale or a fairy tale? Folk tale, really. You got uh, a woman being hidden away by someone. That's an absolute necessity in these stories. Um, and then being treated as a token. You have romance and love at first sight. You have terrible, terrible deeds of great strength and violence. And then you have the wicked acts of a king. <clears throat> uh, if if you enjoyed tonight's stream, please subscribe. Helps me a lot. Or even just like the video. That also helps a lot. If you have something you're interested in me reading around Christmas, keeping in mind that there are a bunch of restrictions on what I can and can't read, um, then uh, just let me know in the comments on the video. Uh, also, let me know if, what you're interested in. I will probably be doing a weird fiction story, which is going to be a little more modern. Uh, by a little more modern, I mean like the 20s. So, like, <laughs> don't don't think I mean too modern. Uh, either next week or the week after. And then after that, I'm probably going to be tilting towards sort of Christmas, Equinox, winter tales. Though I will say it is actually pretty hard to find good tales about winter even though I know they exist. <clears throat> um, GS says, thank you for your wonderful performance, Rory. Well, thank you. And uh, as for myself, uh, I appreciate you keeping me company, GS. I appreciate anybody who watches and lurks out there for your attendance. This is always fun, and it's good to see you. I'll keep the fire going. You have a good sleep. 